Hello, and welcome to the Ed Surge podcast, where every week we look at the future of learning. I am Jeff Young. I'm a reporter and an editor here at Ed Surge. We're a national publication covering innovation in education. When some students hit an obstacle in school or in college, they can take it as a sign that the whole education thing just isn't for them. And that can especially be the case for students who are racial minorities. A clear illustration of this issue came up at the confirmation hearings for Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson. Jackson got emotional as she described a moment early on in her time as a student at Harvard University when she felt deeply out of place. I was walking through Harvard Yard my freshman year. As I mentioned, I went to uh, public school, and I didn't know anything about Harvard until um, my debate coach took me there to enter a speech competition, and I thought, this is a great university. It was basically one of the only ones I'd seen, and I said, maybe I'll apply when I'm a senior. But I get there, and whoa, <laughs> so different. I'm from Miami, Florida. Boston is very cold. Um, <laughs> It was, um, it was rough. It was different from anything I'd known. There were lots of students there who were um, prep school kids, like my husband, <laughs> um, who knew all about <laughs> <laughs> knew all about Harvard, and, and that was not not me. And I think the first semester, I was really homesick. I was really questioning, um, do I belong here? Can I, can I make it in this environment? Our guest this week, Greg Walton, spends his career thinking about situations like that one. He's a psychology professor at Stanford University, and he has spent decades researching how to foster a stronger sense of belonging in educational settings. You know, a lot of our history in education is writ through with race, racial and social class-based exclusion, where people have been excluded from, uh, from, from school settings and from selective school settings and the function, as a function of race and class. And people have that history in their awareness um, and the, the fight that, that their communities have, have engaged in to be able to access education. And that leads to a, a psychological process, this question about, is this an environment in which I can truly belong, in which people will, will receive me well and treat me fairly and include me? It turns out there are things that educators and education leaders can do to help encourage a feeling of belonging for all types of students at the K-12 and college levels. In fact, Greg Walton has helped develop a series of approaches and strategies that his research shows can strengthen student-teacher relationships and that sense of belonging. And he says this shouldn't be some sort of side issue for schools, since the research shows that this sense of belonging can really impact the academic performance of students as well. I sat down with Greg Walton after a talk he gave this month at the South by Southwest EDU Festival down in Austin. We talked about this issue in schools and in college, but I want to start the episode with his thoughts on how the issue plays out in K-12 schools. You know, often in education, um, we, uh, you know, many educators fully recognize the importance of relationships in school, the importance of belonging in school. You can, like, look at people like Uri Bronfenbrenner, one of the founders of Head Start, who said, uh, every child needs an adult who has an irrational attachment to them. Hmm. There's, you know, the, like the, the reason why people go into education, to, to go into teaching, is largely because of the kinds of relationships that they want to have with children yeah. and how those relationships can be spaces for growth for those children, especially often kids from various kinds of backgrounds that are disadvantaged. But um, if you look at the data, like in many ways, our schools are not experienced in that way. So. Um, a, a recent study uh, from using ad health data of high school students found that 52 that kids who in high school ha reported having a natural mentor in high school were 12 to 26 percentage points more likely to go to college than kids who did not controlling for everything else. There's a massive effect, and yet only 15 percent 
of kids had a natural mentor in high school, and that number was lower yet for low SES students, even as the effect of having a mentor was even greater for them. Like, I think if you ask yourself, like, you know, were there people when I was a student, when I was younger, who, uh, you know, saw in me a good person who could become, saw in me things that I could do before I knew I could do them yet? Like, I hope that most people can answer that question, yes. But the reality for many of our kids today is that school is a lonely and judgy and evaluative space. you know, in California, um, statewide surveys find that fewer than 60% of ninth graders report having a caring relationship with an adult. We've made no progress on that in the past 10 years. Like, this is outrageous. Yeah. Um, and so I think that educators look uh, at this and they um, they know the importance of, of relationships and they know that sometimes we're not succeeding in that, but there's a kind of mystery as to why and what's going on. One of the things that's really exciting to me is that Uh, We now uh, have begun to, I think, very clearly identify a limited number of kind of critical turning points in relationships between students and educators, key junctures where relationships can improve and trust can grow and be sustained, or it can be lost. And we're increasingly learning how to get those junctures right. And this is work that in often has come out of education practice itself, has been clarified through research processes and distilled. And now uh, I think we're in a position where we can start to bring that back to education systems and help educators get those junctions right. So school transitions, the belonging intervention is, is one of those junctures, but uh, there's, a, there's a set of them, a, a discrete number of them that uh, can have uh, really, that are high impact practices that can, I think, move the needle on this. Can you give one more exa- one example of one other sure. one that we haven't talked about? Yeah, yes. sure. Um, so this is, this, here, this is one. So um, uh, we have worked, um, uh, so here, I'll give you, here, I'll give you this one. So uh, one example is when there's conflict. So if there's conflict, if there's misbehavior, the teachers responding to the student, teachers know that a huge predictor of whether they're able to achieve, achieve their goals in the classroom is that the class is well ordered and on, on task. Kids who are misbehaving are threatening to that. Uh, and it's very easy in our culture to kind of default to a punitiveness in response to a kid who misbehaves. In fact, we do this as parents. Like, what parent hasn't at one point said, like, go to your room. Like, that's it. I've had it. You know, even as maybe you know that that's not going to be really the most helpful and effective thing. It's not going to do the wonders for your relationship with your kid. Not you might. Long-term solution. It's, not, it's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not. It's not going to cut it, right? Um, and so we, we, we have that kind of def- and we and in school, we have policies like zero tolerance policies, right? We have policies that kind of build in this kind of punitive approach. Well, our research, uh, uh, research uh, led by Jason Akanafua, who's a former graduate student, he's at uh, UC Berkeley now, but moving to Brown University, uh, has created a, a system to offer teachers um, uh, what we call an empathic mindset about uh, misbehavior. Uh, so in a, an approach that involves, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't mean not to discipline. It means that when you discipline, you do so in a way that pulls a kid closer, or doesn't push them away. So you, maybe you give the kid detention, but then you go talk with them about it and you hear what their experience was. And your goal is to maintain a strong relationship even as uh, you're standing up for the, the norms that need to exist in the classroom. Uh, this was randomized to middle school math teachers in multiple uh, randomized control trials, and it reduces school-wide suspension rates uh, through the year and even into the next year. Um, that's a critical turning point. Like your teacher is responding to you, are they kind of throwing you away, or are they are they um, maintaining that relationship with you and listening to you? It matters. Yeah, and so these um, honing in on these different interventions around belonging can make these academic strides like can yeah. lead to the end other just getting them back in the class having you know not doing the throw throw away yeah kids who are suspended are obviously not in school learning sure sure, sure. um that's really interesting and is there uh, this is probably all something i can link to in the show notes here like some of these practices people can see yeah yeah, yeah. The, uh, the these so the other ones that i would think about the schools their school transitions there's the provision of critical feedback uh, and how students understand that feedback. Uh, the third is um, uh, when students struggle, like how do teachers respond when students are struggling uh, or when they fail. And a fourth is when students are in particularly vulnerable populations, and by vulnerable, I mean vulnerable to being misseen or unseen. 
Uh, these are groups like kids involved in the justice system, foster youth, ELL kids, refugee or newcomer students, kids caught with substance use issues. There's like it's very easy in our society to either not see these kids, like with ELL students, or to see them sort of simply through the lens of a pejorative um, stereotype. And in these cases, giving students appropriate platforms to introduce or reintroduce who they are, their goals, their values, what they want to achieve in school, the challenges that they face that the adult could help with, can transform students' lives. We found in an early randomized control trial with justice-involved youth in Oakland, um, this procedure, which we call lifting the bar, caused a 40 percentage point reduction in recidivism to juvenile detention through the next semester. I'm always curious to hear how people got into the research that they do. So I asked Greg how he got into studying belonging in the first place. I was in high school, and I was part of a student group that, um, that went into middle school classrooms and led role-playing exercises and games focused on inequality by race and class and other factors. And uh, as part of that school um, group, that student group, we read some of the early research on stereotype threat that Claude Steele published in the Atlantic Monthly. And this was research that showed that you just changed how you represented a, a testing situation. You either called it a test or you just called it verbal puzzles. And you saw inequalities either be very large and seemingly very real, or you saw them actually disappear. And Based on this, so this is, yeah, this, this idea of stereotype threat, of just, yeah. just on how it's presented how it's kind of couched. Yeah, so you represent an activity as an evaluative test, mm -hmm. a test that's going to evaluate your verbal skills and abilities, your strengths and your limitations, and white people, at white Stanford students in the original work do a whole lot better on that test than black Stanford students, even with the same preparation, the same test scores, for example. Sure. And I thought, but then you represent the exact same thing as just verbal puzzles, very difficult verbal puzzles, and the inequality goes away. And I thought that was that was amazing. I thought that was uh, um, potentially um, kind of low-hanging fruit to try to improve outcomes and reduce inequality in education. As a as a kid, it was very disturbing to me to think about how, um, you know, I was growing up as a white person in a middle-class household, and to think that people in my generation wouldn't necessarily have the same uh, opportunities that I had, the kind of falseness of the American dream, it was very upsetting for me. And this was a, a way to start to understand why one one source of that inequality and one way to make progress on it. And for me, uh, stereotype threat was always uh, very much a kind of social relational issue. People can understand stereotype threat in different ways. Claude often talked about it, Claude Steele often talked about it in the um, um, almost the passive voice, like a threat in the air, you're kind of on thin ice with these metaphors. And for me, it was, it was really about how you might appear in that, in that space, how you might look, what it might look like if you were to do badly. It might confirm a stereotype in the eyes of others. So that led through many twists and turns to this idea of belonging and certainty, the idea that when you walk into a school setting and you're worried about whether you might belong uh, in that environment. Maybe your group historically has been excluded. Maybe some people allege that your group isn't as able as others. Maybe there's, um, you know, not just there's just an underrepresentation of your group in that environment. It's easy to wonder whether you'll be fully included and valued in that space. And I've heard you talk about just these little cues. It could be as as little as like signs around or just an environment um, yeah. it, that that might people might take for granted. Yeah, so it can be very small things. So Sepna Chirian, who's a professor at University of Washington, has done work on gender and uh, and belonging issues. And one of the things that she's found is that in a study done at Stanford, she took over a, a small room in the computer science department. And in one condition, she populated this room with these artifacts of kind of geeky masculine culture, like a Star Trek poster, Diet Coke cans. And when women and men came into that environment, women reported a lot less interest in computer science than men. But when she changed that setting and replaced the poster with a nature poster, put in water bottles, then women were actually even more interested in computer science than men. And what was happening was that women were looking at this space and they were saying, this is kind of a geeky masculine space. Who would I, who could I be here? What kind of overlap is there between who I am as a woman and what this space allows? And that didn't look very good. And then they weren't interested. Similarly, uh, you know, there's, there's many um, stories about belonging and certainty uh, for students of color and for first generation college students. Um, Supreme Court Justice, Justice Sonia Sotomayor tells a story about her own experience coming to Princeton. Uh, Katanji Brown-Jackson spoke in her confirmation hearings about her experiences uh, at Harvard. 
Okay, so you and you've put this idea to the test in in educational settings. Yeah. So we so one of the early studies just testing that uh, psychological process. Uh, we took uh, black and white students and we asked them to list either two friends of theirs or eight friends of theirs who would fit in well in a particular field of study. And the logic of this manipulation was that listing two friends is easy and listing eight friends is hard, and it was easy or hard for everybody. The question was, what inference, if any, would people draw from that difficulty of listing eight friends? And the finding was that for white students, basically no inference. They, they, were, they were reasonably optimistic about their prospects of succeeding and belonging in, in the field of study, uh, regardless of the condition. But for African-American students and also for Hispanic students, when they'd been asked to list eight friends, their, their confidence in their potential to succeed in the field, whether they would belong in the field, dropped. Um, and for African-American students, not only did they feel like they personally might not be a fit for the field, they also became, came to start to discourage another black student who was potentially interested in the field from going into it and encouraged him to go elsewhere. As though the difficulty of listing eight friends was coded as inf information that not just Maybe I wouldn't belong here, but people like me uh, wouldn't belong here. And that's that history that's, that's rearing its head. Wow. And so um, what, do you, you know, what, what do you make of this for a school or college leader to like, take from a, a research finding like that? Yeah. So one of the things that's really important here is that there's a very specific and very actionable psychological process. And that specific, there's a lot of other things going on here when we talk about inclusion and belonging and race and class and education and higher education. But in the heart of belonging and certainty, there's something very specific, which is what is the inference that people draw when they have everyday challenges in school? Like, for example, you don't, you have difficulty listing friends in a field of study. And the, 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 the circumstance of belonging uncertainty is one in which, which leads people to an inference that maybe this has this big global meaning. Maybe this means that me and people like me don't belong here. Uh, Michelle Robinson Obama told an incredible story uh, in 2014 when she was the first lady. Uh, she was speaking to a group of college leaders. She was at the White House. She, um, the story that she told was about her transition to Princeton. When she came to Princeton, she said, uh, that she got to her dorm room and she found that the sheets she'd brought for her dorm room bed didn't fit because she didn't know that the beds were extra long. And she's telling this story she's t and how she felt that made her feel alienated, how it made her feel like she didn't belong. She's telling the story now 20 plus years later as maybe the most widely admired and respected woman in America, the first lady of the United States, a person who's been professionally successful for decades. The story that she's telling, it's a remarkable story because the story that she's telling, there's no racist person in it. There's not even, there's no villain. There's no the other actor even. But sure, it's, and it's about sheets. It's, it's about sheets. It seems like it's an errand. But as a kid from the south side of Chicago, as a person who's a descendant of enslaved peoples, as a first generation college student going to an institution, many of whose first presidents owned slaves, you know, the institution was in part built upon slavery, that triggered this question whether someone like her could belong in a place like that. And that's a really potent, powerful question for a young person because what is it that we go to college for? We go to college to become, like to gain access to the skills and the resources and the relationships and the networks and the know-how that can help us do things in our life, to become leaders of communities, to give back to others, uh, to make differences that we want to make, to make an impact on causes that we value, to do well by our families. And that's at stake uh, in that question. Hmm. It also strikes me that also it's a piece of missing information. Like maybe people knew about the long sheets, but but she's not in the know in that yeah. particular instance. And so, I mean, we've talked in previous episodes of the podcast about kind of the hidden curriculum that can yep. go on at certain schools um, or certain educational settings that like it's just assumed maybe by the pr professor say that people know how to do a read a syllabus or whatever but not everybody has done that in their has encountered something in that format in a previous schooling say right so the one thing is the hidden curriculum some people might have more kind of know-how than others but the other thing is the inference that a student draws when they face a challenge and you would ask earlier like uh, what is a university leader doing? I'm going to come back to that. So in the, in the case of things like bureaucratic red tape, research shows that like everybody finds things like really confusing financial aid forms or uh, website systems that crash every time you try them. 
uh, everybody finds that annoying. But if you're a first-generation college student, those start to trigger worries about belonging because there's a belonging uncertainty there. Is, it just, is there something wrong with me? Is there, I can't even navigate how to sign up for classes. How am I ever going to graduate? How am I going to actually take the classes? But for a continuing generation student, they're just like, what bunch of idiots designed this system, right? So it's still annoying. Uh, and it's still a hassle, but it doesn't have the kind of broader, it doesn't provoke the broader questions uh, that are at hand. Here, here's just one other example to, to think about. A few years ago, uh, a grad student at Yale, a black grad student at Yale fell asleep in a lounge. Somebody called the police. The police come in on her and they say, we need to see if you belong here. Show us your ID. Now, that incident, if that incident had happened at, say, Howard University or uh, another HBCU, that incident would still have been a negative incident. But it doesn't have the same resonance, uh, the same toxic resonance, the broader, the broader threat that it has uh, at an institution uh, like Yale, which also has its own uh, kind of racist histories. Interesting. So then, then the, the uh, one very important thing for college leaders to focus on then is to help students understand that these kinds of everyday challenges, when they happen, um, can be normal uh, and can improve with time. So something like not having the right size sheets for your dorm room bed, something like feeling homesick at first, getting a bad grade at first, maybe not knowing how to interact with college professors, that this is a major transition. Uh, this is difficult uh, for everybody. It has different forms of that difficulty. Uh, but it is normal to worry at first about whether you belong in that process, and that can get better with time. And what that does is it doesn't prevent um, homesickness, it doesn't prevent that early bad grade, but it can prevent those events from seeming to have this this broader threatening meaning. Hmm. And so it's, it's in a way a small thing can be done to, to make a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, the sm it's small. The word small is very complicated. So it's small from a, uh, potentially from a financial perspective. It's small potentially from a kind of programmatic perspective. Um, but it can be enormous to a student who's sitting there, you know, in a class wondering, what does it mean that my professor just kind of blew me off? What does it mean that I feel like I don't have anybody to have a study group with? To like have the sense that you're not alone in that experience, that that experience is part of the college transition, that that can get better with time, that could be huge. It could be nothing bigger than that. And that's why in some cases when we do these interventions, we see really outsized uh, effects. Now, I feel like there's a bit more attention raised to these issues of belonging these days. Um, how are they, are they, what do you attribute that to? Is it changing demographics? Have they always been there and they weren't um, you know, understood as widely or both? Uh, I mean, I think the culture has changed a lot. Um, in you know, we published our first work on the belonging, um, belonging uncertainty, and the belonging intervention in two thousand seven. Um, I do think that that part of there is a kind of uh, culture cycle here, partly where that research itself uh, accelerated some of that um, uh, sort of public conversation about belonging. Um, certainly, you see uh, far more. Picture books, for example, talking about belonging now. Um, there was a beautiful book after COVID that our kids' elementary school teachers, both of them read to the kids in which a person is coming to elementary school and they're really nervous and they don't want to go and the parent has to get them out of the house and get them to go. And then only at the end of the book is it revealed that the person who has been worrying about their belonging and anxious to go is, in fact, the classroom teacher. And in one of, for one of our kids, uh, the teacher read this, and then she kind of beautifully described her own feelings of belonging and certainty as she came to the class, and like the kids are all like, kind of blown away by this idea. So there, there's certainly you know there's books like New Kid, uh, the Jerry Craft book. Uh, there's um, scholarship programs that focus on belonging now. Um, so it's become I think I think it's become part of the culture. When I went to college, um, it was like. Uh, rah, 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 yay, you're in college. It's the best years of your life. There is no acknowledgement of any of the complexity of that experience, any of the process of that, any of how that might change over time. There's no acknowledgement that sometimes there might be difficulties and that was okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there, it was, maybe there's a, like a nod to homesickness, but it's almost like just get over a kid or something. Yeah, yeah. Huh, huh. And so, okay, so there is more awareness, but it sounds like, it sounds like, it's not over like that it it's feels like if you're still working on this that that more needs to be done or yeah. in your view yeah i i think that um 
I think part of the dynamic is a is a peer dynamic among students, right? Like you're 18 years old, you're just going to college, you're worried about whether you belong. That's the last thing you want to talk about and admit to, right? So it's not something that we can count on kind of spontaneously happening among students. What we need to do in leading organizations and in creating the structures with which students interact is to create the spaces where people can have these kinds of conversations in, in real and authentic ways to talk about experiences of belonging, to talk about times you really, this is what I do in my freshman seminar every year, tell me a time that you really felt you belonged at Stanford. Tell me about a time where maybe you felt like you didn't belong. Uh, tell me about how your experience has changed over time. And in uh, one of the ways to do this is to have people um, write these, uh, these responses without identifying themselves. Sometimes we call this a crumple paper belonging exercise. Mm. You crumple all those papers up, you throw them in the middle of the table, and then people start to take them out and uncrumple them and read them aloud. And what's very powerful is that you see the commonality of the themes and the worries that were otherwise hidden. That suddenly then they become on the surface and then you can talk about them. Why is that normal? How does that happen? How does that develop over time? Why haven't we talked about this before? And people aren't so focused on that this person is feeling this. No, because it's not about that. It's, it's, I mean, I, I have my version of the story. I'm sure you have your version of your story. Everybody has a version of the story. And the stories are different, and that difference matters. But there's also a common story. And when we don't tell that common story or understand that that's a common story, it's easy to feel like you're alone in your challenges, or maybe your, your group is alone in its challenges. You know, one thing that's happened since 2007 is COVID and the, the disruptions all over society, including education. And I wonder how much you feel like that plays a role, or are we, in a way, coming back from that in terms of belonging on campus? Yeah, I think COVID's been, I mean, COVID was really difficult and isolating, especially for, uh, you know, adolescents. Like, adolescence is a time when you're trying to reach out and interact more broadly with the world and develop broader relationships. And, you know, to be locked at home with your parents is like the, the worst the worst circumstance. Um, and, and, and sort of cut off from your peers. Cut off from your peers or, or just resorting to social media, which has its own problems. So, um, yeah, I mean, I also think that the culture has moved um, so that people are, um, it's easier for people to have these vulnerable conversations in certain circumstances. So uh, a couple of years ago, I was the faculty member um, at Stanford's campus, our center in Berlin, and we had an opening uh, dinner, and I sat next to a young woman, a Stanford undergraduate, and I asked her, uh, I had never met her before, so I just asked her about her life, and she tells me, that she was a very competitive gymnast in high school uh, and then she blew her knee out so she couldn't compete anymore and then COVID happened so she couldn't see her friends anymore and she didn't she just said it in a very factual kind of open way and it, the way that she said it allowed me to say to her uh, the thought that I think is is relevant which is like did that make you depressed and I just said that to her and then she said absolutely I mean I was already seen a therapist but for sure and I don't think that a person in my generation would have been, especially at the age of like 19 or 20, I don't think I would have been, I don't think most people would have been so comfortable just saying that. But I think it was a healthy conversation. It was like, here's the circumstance. Like you're 18 years old, you can't do the thing that you love to do, you can't see your friends, you're stuck at home with your parents. Would that make a person depressed? It might well make you depressed. There, there it is. is. Like, like is there shame. is there yeah, and is there some help to be gotten for that? Yeah, yes, so, there is, and I been she got it. Yeah, and but but part of the help, like there could be clinical help, but part of the help is also just that's a normal response. You're a normal human being. There's nothing wrong with you. There it is. Like, would that make a person depressed? Yes. Okay. Like now we understand each other. We're that's where we are. And there, I think the the def, the the defensiveness, the obfuscation, the gaslighting even of yourself sometimes to not see those things makes it a lot harder to deal with them. Okay, so that's a positive in, in, in your view then of that potentially that we're, there's some unlocking of that ability to at least face these issues. Yeah, yeah. but I don't think that it, I still don't think it's going to happen naturally, especially with belonging. So I think I think you need to create the spaces like the crumple paper exercise. There's some lovely research uh, done um, at the University of Pittsburgh by Kevin Binning, a psychologist, along with a team of physics and um, chemistry faculty where they have integrated belonging conversations into first year um, science classes. 
uh, to very good effect. Uh, and they've done this with randomized controlled trials and found that this can eliminate racial disparities in biology classes and gender disparities in physics classes, and in some cases even support um, greater persistence in college over time. So there's ways that that college leaders, people who are you know leading dorm dorm activities, uh, residence assistants, uh, instructors, uh, university leaders uh, can help su- help us move towards those conversations and help people have them in more effective ways. Yeah, I, we had an episode not long ago with Janine Turner at, at Georgetown University, and she was talking a little bit about um, suggesting that there be more time in a class to like help students get to know each other, that you can't assume that there has been, that that's, these things hadn't been seen as a college-worthy way to spend time um, by a lot of people, I think. But she was actually like, this is key to then having them be, you know, comfortable in pure, pure teaching each other or sharing or just having interactions and feeling not just feeling connected, but 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 persisting. Yeah. So one way to think about that is implicitly, does a student feel like they can only be part of themselves when they come into the classroom or do they feel like they can bring their whole selves to that space? So. We did a a study, um, uh, this is an unpublished study, but we did a study uh, at a university where we asked students every day how in touch with their most important values uh, they were, they felt that day. And what we found was that students of color and first generation students reported being less in touch with their most important values on a daily basis in college, especially when they faced academic challenges. And that predicted less resilient responses to those challenges. Um, Then there's certain kinds of even very sort of basic signaling um, interventions that can help people, can kind of invite people to be their whole self in class. So Eric Smith, who's a research associate here at UT Austin, a former graduate student at Stanford, did a study where he just embedded a a paragraph in course syllabi um, describing the purpose of office hours. So usually you represent office hours as a place to a- ask questions about the class content. But he changed that in a random basis to say um, it's an opportunity for us to get to know you better, for you to, to hear about your interests and your goals. And it wasn't that people ended up going to office hours more. Actually, there's no increase in going to office hours. But that increased grades for students of color uh, and first generation students reducing um, inequalities in the college classroom. How do you, and why do you, what is the the mechanism? I think it's because it's signaling to people that all of them is welcome in that space, that who you are, including, for example, your racial, ethnic, or social class background, that that is valued and that is welcome and that can be brought to bear on on course content, uh, that that's a relevant part of who you are. And we we see you. We we are ready to to see all of you. Yeah. Yeah. you know, it seems like, you know, what what is at stake with getting this right? I mean, there's so much at stake, right? There's so much at stake for colleges, and there's so much at stake for our society, and there's so much at stake for communities. Uh, you know, people are doubting the value proposition of colleges. People are doubting whether colleges are uh, really serving as vehicles of upward mobility, really vehicles for uh, people to achieve the American dream rather than just, you know, reenfranchising the status hierarchy. And, um, you know, we also know that that successful colleges and universities drive economic growth and economic growth in communities. So for all of these reasons, for the colleges themselves to justify their existence, to achieve the collective mission that we all hold to have a fairer, more equal society where, you know, any kid from anywhere can can succeed um, and for future economic prosperity. Um, we, we need colleges to be able to create environments that are welcoming and inclusive for people, for learners from all backgrounds and that value them and help them give them what they need to succeed. Um, we also face, just more broadly, we face huge problems in society, right? We face climate change. Uh, we face uh, the, the you know, artificial intelligence and, and the complexities that that will provide us. We face uh, major global threats. And we need to develop young people who will have creative and diverse uh, solutions and approaches uh, to all of these kinds of problems. Yeah. And what do you think is the biggest obstacle to what, as you presented here, sounds very common sense in a lot of these instances and these kind of tactical and and moment, you know, moment to moment situations. But uh, but as we talked about, they don't always happen. Yeah, it's not common. I mean, so so. It's not common sense 
that changing the paragraph in a syllabus is going to reduce inequalities in the classroom. It's not common sense that having a, a productive opportunity to reflect on experiences of belonging is going to reduce racial or gender disparities in achievement years into the future. Um, I once, uh, uh, early in my time at Stanford, I um, presented some research on social belonging and growth mindset and values affirmation interventions to a, a university committee uh, with the hopes of um, building a partnership with the university to uh, start to implement some of these interventions on campus, partly uh, as a researcher, but also partly as an alumnus of Stanford. And I came into this meeting with the um, frontline staff, very committed and very enthusiastic about this, the people who saw every day the ways that students struggled with worries about belonging, for example. And the most senior administrator there basically looked at it and said, I don't believe it. It's like what she saw was magic, and she didn't believe in magic. And like if I had been a physicist coming in and used a bunch of complicated physics terms that she didn't know, she would have just had to kind of nod and agree. But I was talking about psychology, how people think and feel, and it was too squishy and unsystematic, and she had two, her lay theories were too built to be able to be responsive to the evidence that I was providing. That delayed the project a full year. So, you know, I think partly it's like really taking seriously like how people make sense of themselves and school situations is fundamentally important. Like that's as important as anything else. And there's a science of that, of how to understand that, how that goes wrong, and how to help that go right. And then there's the problem of kind of governance and heterogeneity. So you have, you know, you have an incredibly de decentralized system. It's very hard to drive change uh, systematically across that system. So you have lots of gatekeepers like that one individual administrator who can hold up projects. I see. So it's been far from a slam dunk to implement some of these ideas once, even with your research backing it. Yeah, I mean, we, we implement, we, I mean, there are many success stories and there are many like cases where universities are very motivated to get it right and they see particular problems and they access the solutions that have been created often in research practice partnerships and evaluated in RCTs, and they, and they run with those. And sometimes they elaborate upon them in, in wonderfully creative and powerful ways. Um, but to create systems-wide change is, is, a, is a real challenge. You know, another topic that I, I feel is related that we've done a lot of coverage on the podcast is the sense of, of you know the experience of a student and and the distracted nature of 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 students in many cases from devices and from just the going back to that covid disruption that happened to socialization and i i, I hear you've done some research along those lines as well um separate research uh, on on some distraction and its implications yeah so you know the research on belonging is a, is a research that's about do students feel like they're a member of this community, of the classroom community, of the college community? And uh, can they fully participate in that community? Will they be received well? The research uh, that you're referring to is research that's uh, essentially about what are the norms of this community? Like, what are the ways that we'll interact? What are the uh, ways that we'll structure our interactions so that we can all achieve our goals uh, in a setting like a college classroom? So, you know, this work began with the observation I'm sure you're familiar with that. You know, kids sometimes show up to college classes, uh, but then they're sitting in like, you know, the back row or maybe the first row and they're shopping on Home Depot dot com or they're on, you know, a social media site or whatever they're doing. Yes, we in, we, in fact, I got to see this for an episode we did um, not too long ago where I went to a university and saw exactly that just sitting in the yeah. back row of several large lecture classes, you know, shopping, video games. Right. Yeah. Right. And it's. Um, it's like not what the student's goal is. Like the student has actually showed up to the class, like ostensibly to learn. Right? They might have taken a bus. They they got out to, to get there. Right. Yeah. They, they're, they're there at least, right? Um, and so you know, we we worked uh, for several years on this problem, and uh, we were doing this in introductory psychology classes. And so they, one of the advantages of that is that um, there was an early lecture in these classes on research methods, and the the content of the lecture on research methods was uh, to describe all these different methods that could reveal 
uh, this relationship between distracted distractedness and, and media use in classrooms and its effects on learning. So there's like a correlational study, a causal study. There's evidence that it undermines not only the learning of the person who's on the you know social media site, but also all the other people around them who are distracted by that behavior. The kind of bystanders sitting yeah, nearby bystanders. as someone's shopping or playing a video game. Exactly, exactly. right. So we had seen... Um, uh, so we had we had, we'd, we were in this context where students were all exposed to that, and yet we were still seeing students be you know report in midterm and end of term uh, uh, anonymous surveys that they spent like huge amounts of time, like a third of the lecture class, you know, doing this stuff. Like if you add that up with tuition at a private university, it's a lot of money. So. Then the first thing we did was we developed a kind of best-in-class individual self-regulation intervention. So this is things like exposing students to stories from other students who described this challenge and then how they made progress on it by, for example, putting their device on airplane mode uh, or committing uh, personally to it or writing letters of advice to future students about how they could manage this self-regulatory problem. The students loved the activity when we asked them about it, but it had zero lasting effect on their behavior, that is their use of uh, technology for inappropriate uh, uses, and uh, the degree to which they were dis they were distracted by it or thought about, uh, thought about that use. So promising to go on airplane mode did not do it? No, didn't do it, didn't do anything. Um, and so then we uh, took a different approach. We thought, what is this community? This is a classroom community. Like this is a community that's built for a very specific purpose. It's built for teaching and learning. Uh, we've presented all this evidence that this kind of behavior is getting in the way of that collective goal that the teacher and the students all have. Why don't we just say this is going to be our, our course policy? It's not like a heavy-handed rule. If somebody violates it, nobody's going to get punished. There's no like real monitoring or accountability. No one's going to rip that cell phone no out of your hand and put it in a drawer. No, it's, 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 it's just going to be saying, here's our commitment to each other. And the person who has the standing, in a sense, to do that is the professor at the head of the lecture hall. So the professor says in these um, uh, terms, here's, here's that evidence. So therefore, we're going to be a no laptop class. We're just not going to go there. We're not going to use those. And the, the, we then tracked that. We did this multiple terms, and we tracked it, and we found, first of all, that completely eliminated the behavior. Students were no longer using devices for inappropriate uh, functions. The second thing was that they were no longer tempted by it. It, was, it wasn't just they weren't doing it. They weren't thinking about it. So they reported far fewer urges to like get out their phone and check their email or respond to a text, for example. And then the third thing that was really remarkable was that students completely endorsed it. So when we hadn't implemented this, students said, oh, that policy would be infantilizing. Don't treat us like children. We're adults. We can manage our own behavior. It was almost like they wanted what I think of now as the kind of self-regulatory burden of having to manage that temptation on a moment-by-moment -moment basis. But when we had given students the experience of having a lecture class where that was the, the policy was that you wouldn't do that, students said, I love this. It allowed me to focus. It created the classroom community I wanted. It allowed me to be fully engaged. Every, every, uh, every course should have this policy. They felt thankful that we had um, uh, per, sort of taken that burden off of their shoulders. There's a, there's a sense sometimes um, that we have that uh, radical freedom uh, means that the individual gets to control everything. But what our students were telling us was that they felt more free when the context had constrained that behavior. Because now they were free to focus, they were free to engage, they were, they were interacting with the space, with uh, the goals that they had for that space uh, being top of mind. It's almost, you know, I, I bet... For for me, I'm thinking of the times I've gotten on an airplane before there was Wi-Fi on airplanes, and you're just like, I, there's no way you could get to the internet. And so I might read a book I haven't done in a while, or you're doing some activity, or if they make, you know, when you're landing, you have to put away your big devices. It's like these moments where, and it's almost a gift to, mm -hmm. to have a restraint or a, a sort of shared, um, yeah. yeah. And if you think about it, like we structure lots of things in society like this. So... Like, there's a gym, right? You go to the gym in order to work out. That is the purpose of the gym. Sure. There is a library. Like, you go to the library for quiet focus, right? That's the purpose of They don't go to the library to, like, throw a football around, right? Like, that's not the purpose of the library. So, like, we create lots of spaces, and then we build those spaces both 
like structurally in terms of what is physically in those spaces, but we also build them with social norms about what's appropriate in those spaces. So in the library, we put lots of books, we put comfortable chairs, we create spaces for people that people can physically use to have that focus. Um, but we also have a norm that you shouldn't talk loudly in the library and you shouldn't throw a football around, right? And those um, physical and psychological affordances um, allow us to pursue the goals that we have at that time and in That's that space. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. not to say that throwing the football around isn't a great thing to do, but it's just not what you do in the library, right? And so similarly, like a college lecture class, college lecture class isn't for I am and your friends. College lecture class is for being in the learning environment. And we want to make that learning environment as, as rich and impactful and good and use that time as well as we can. How do you think we lost that norm? Is it, I mean, is it partly because of this idea that, you know, this outcry students might have of like, just let us be adults, we have to learn it later, we have to learn how to manage, manage ourselves. ourselves? Yeah, I mean, that dialogue has been true like for, uh, for many different public health initiatives in U.S. history. So seatbelt use, it's my freedom to not wear a seatbelt. Uh, motorcycle helmets, it's my freedom not to wear a, a, a helmet. Um, bike helmet, same thing. Sure. And... Um, I think what this research has made me think about is, are, does that really make us more free, like that, that attitude? Are we sometimes more free by accepting constraints and then allowing ourselves to, to giving ourselves the freedom to like really be present and focus on, on the thing that that environment is for? It sounds like you've come to, well, let me, let me ask you, when your classes that you teach at Stanford, what's your policy? Yeah, yeah the, the, no laptops. It's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not how we want to be. It's not, it's not serving our goals, our collective goals. But you don't couch it as a ban. How do you say it to students? I say there's this research. And so given this research and given this, that these are our goals, we're, we're not going to do laptops in this class. And if you need an exception, if there's a reason, absolutely. It's not like we're going to be draconian about this. But, you know, I want to be present with you and I want you to be present with me. And it works. And it works. By and large, it works. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's going to be harder and easier in some contexts than others, right? Uh, there, every context is different. But I think it is worth asking yourself, what are the goals of this space? And how can I, uh, you know, how can I, given the role that I have, contribute to the social norms in that space that will help people in regulating their behavior to achieve that collective goal that we all have? Hmm. Another, I mean, another kind of, so this is about, focusing on, um, you know, the, the content of the, the schoolwork. But uh, another kind of norm is about how we respond to people who are different from us and how we value diversity. So Sohad Marar, who's a, a professor at University of Illinois, Chicago, and Marcus Brower, who's at Wisconsin, have a, a series of studies where they show that just communicating um, pro-diversity norms, the real pro-diversity norms that exist, in this case at the University, University of Wisconsin, uh, within college classrooms, either with posters or with very short videos that describe students are uh, endorsing diversity in general and valuing people from diverse backgrounds, that created a more inclusive and better learning environment for students. So I want to cut in and play a short clip from one of the videos that he's talking about, which features interviews with students talking about the importance of student diversity. I have a lot of friends from different diverse backgrounds, and I think it makes me a more well-rounded person. But I feel that it, it brings a, a different perspective that helps me in, in my daily life. It's always fun just to see people from different bi backgrounds and then knowing different perspectives, and it's just um, a really important part of my life, yes. And he says showing these videos made a difference. All students, and particularly uh, students from um, racial ethnic minority groups, low SES groups, and religious minority groups uh, reported um, that the environment was more inclusive, that peers were more inclusive and accepting of them, and that actually caused an increase in grades reducing inequalities and achievement in those classes. So like, there's lots of ways we can think about very intentionally what are the norms that we want to create in this space, given the goals that we have, and how, what is the role that I have in, in facilitating that norm. When I did have Janine Turner recently from Georgetown, she she worried though that in some ways with with technology that we have, we're so reliant in the world on our cell phones, a eh, that to be able to reach each other, the norm, these other norms, these these norms out of the class, that it can make it hard, especially for some students who might be 
you know, like have some family member needing to reach them in some emergency type setting. So I guess, and it sounds like you have some exceptions built into your policy, but I guess there are these competing norms, these larger norms with technology and with other things in our society that get in the way of even, you know, the gym being used for gym even probably, you know? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I still think that a person who's leading a context has the standing to say, here's how I understand the goals that, that are in this context, in this classroom. And here's my vision for how we will interact with each other to achieve these goals, to, to be who we want to be for each other in this space. And it's not to say anything about what happens in other spaces. Uh, it's just, in a sense, it's a, it's a standing up in some ways for the sacredness of a learning environment. I mean, we create schools in order to help people learn and become like members of our community as adults and make differences, you know, for ourselves and our whole society. Like, is there nothing more important than that? Right. This is this is a sacred thing, I think. And um, and so I think that a, a leader of a, of a classroom environment has that standing to, to, to do that. It's not to pass judgment on anything else or any kind of multitasking or whatever else happens in other settings. It's just saying within this space here. It feels like that is one of the bigger themes that it feels sometimes like we've, we have lost maybe of that sense of shared agreement on the sacredness of a learning space. Yeah, I wonder about that. I mean, one of the things that's happened with... Um, uh, with COVID was this huge spike in absenteeism at the at the secondary, you know, K, at the K-12 level. Yeah, yeah, we've certainly tracked that. It's happening all over the country. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, it, it feels like families for all sorts of reasons are willing to um, pull their kids from school for, for many different reasons. And I know that these are sometimes quite complicated discussions um, and sometimes they involve things like uh, the safety of the school environment, the physical safety or the psychological safety. But I do think it's valuable to keep in mind the goal of having uh, a, you know school settings uh, that are fully inclusive, where everybody belongs, where everybody is growing and becoming the kind of person who they want to be that can be a, a great member of our community and that that's really important like that is really really important and I don't want to lose sight of that that's maybe more important than anything else I think yeah well it might be a good place to leave it thank you so much for sharing today yeah thank you for having me before I totally sign off here I wanted to go back to that moment at the top of the episode from the confirmation hearings of Supreme Court Justice Katanji Brown Jackson the question that had sparked this answer was when she was asked to talk about why she spends so much time talking to young people and encouraging them to feel like they can follow their dreams, whatever they are. And she shared that a small gesture by a stranger helped her get through that day at Harvard when she felt she did not belong. And I was walking through the yard in the evening, and a black woman I did not know was passing me on the sidewalk and she looked at me and I guess she knew how I was feeling and she leaned over as we crossed and said persevere I would tell them to persevere thank you Judge Jackson you don't have to hope I'll tell you right now you do inspire you are an inspiration This has been the Ed Surge Podcast. Every week, we bring you conversations like this one. If you like the show, I hope you'll follow the Ed Surge Podcast wherever you listen, whether it's Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever. And please take a minute to leave a rating or a review. Doing that really helps the show because it kind of gives us a boost in their whole recommendation algorithm and things like Apple Podcasts. I wanted to thank a listener who gave us a good review recently and said, quote, a great listen for leaders in the education space. Really appreciate that. I mean, my day. Thanks again. This episode was put together by me, Jeff Young. And you can find me on X at JR Young or on the web at jeffyoung.net. If you want to shoot any thoughts on this episode or others, I'm at jeff at edsurge.com. Editing this episode by Rebecca Koenig. And our music is by Komaku. 
We will be back next week with more on the future of learning. Thanks for listening.